call the Griffin Sullivan County School System Board of Education meeting for November the 3rd at 4 o'clock to, to order. We have entered into the Thanksgiving season, and uh, some of us have more to be thankful than others, but uh, I am sure been appreciative of all the prayers and support that have gone up uh, for myself. I just wanted to say that. If you would, place all your electronic devices on silent or uh, turn them off. Uh, those are on the uh, Zoom. If you'll just stay muted until it's time for you to talk, that would be great. So uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to um, my colleague, Mr. Sintel Brown. He is on Zoom. So if you can see on the, uh, the screen up there, he is going to do our school spotlight. Mr. Chair, welcome back. Thank you for having me back. Our school spotlight will be
I'll give a hand to Laura Ellington. I do apologize for the audio and the, and the breakup that was taking place. We do have that in written format, and we will get that added to the website so that we can, uh, that can be seen and everybody have that. Uh, also, let it be known that Mr. Brown is joining us virtually. His day job uh, required, especially on election day, for him to be with his candidates, and so I was grateful for him to be able to uh, take the time out of the day to be able to be with us. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown is the one that has always done those, but we will make sure that they do get their, their certificate. Do we have anyone from all in here? Would you, would you please stand and would you come up right up here? I am not going to stand up to, but we want to take quick pictures. We want to need a quick picture. Quick picture. Yes, we do have a certificate payer and it will be given to you, uh, this public home. We do, and we will, and we will be able. I don't have a copy. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yeah, we have to use the word for this period. We have to have to then going to move right into our prayer and pledge, and I've asked Mr. Holmes if he would do our prayer, and then joining us via Zoom is Mr. Uh, Yusef Ali, a fourth grader at Moreland Elementary. He is going to lead us in our pledge, so if you would, Mr. stand. Mr. Chair, uh, I, I, before we stand, I tried to shoot a uh, text to him, but I, I'm taking him off guard, but uh, we, we have what I call the father of men and women Griffin here with us tonight. And I will humbly ask Dr. Lacey if you would come and give us our case. <laughs> I know, Doc, you get laid. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. 
I'm Julia Robin Cook. I would like to thank you for your education and long honor of positions of in the policy and legislative process. We will now return to the third, 2020, Board of Education meeting are as follows. On Tuesday, November 17, 2020, Board of Education will have its monthly work session at 1 p.m. On Wednesday, November 18, 2020, the retirement celebration of Superintendent James D. Smith will be held at the Griffin College and Career Academy Aviation Building, located at 221 Baldwin Drive, Griffin, Georgia, 3024, from 4 30 p.m. to 6 p.m. Griffin Swapping County School System Thanksgiving Break is the week of November 23rd to 27th, 2020. On Tuesday, December 3rd, 2020, the Board of Education will have its Board of Education meeting at 6 p.m. The 2020 virtual annual GSBA GSFA conference will take place Thursday, December 3rd through Friday, December 4th, 2020. Griffith Swapping County School System, including the school, will take place the week of December 7th through the 11th, 2020. On Friday, December 18th, 2020, AD Healthy Academy will hold their graduation at Griffin Auditorium at 9.30 a.m. Governance team, cabinet members, and stakeholders. This concludes the Board of Education announcements for Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. We appreciate that. Board members, at this time, I would entertain a motion for the adoption of our agenda. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Cook. Second. I have a second by Ms. McDonald. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up our the back here. Um, Mr. Brown, you, you're break. If you can speak very slowly, because you are breaking up so bad that we're having trouble understanding. I am still in the backwood of county. I would suggest that we log off and come back on. We are, we're not able to understand. It's breaking up so bad that we're not able to understand. Is he coming right back in? Can you tell? Yeah, there he is. Okay. We're going to give him this one up before we ha have a vote on this. Is that better? Let's try it. Is that better? No, sir. It still seems to be breaking up on us. <laughs> what about that? Let's try it and see. Brian, if you're okay, unless it was it's something major that you need to call in, uh, we're going to move forward with the vote. Well, let's see if you can hear me now. Seems to be better. Try it. All right, sir. So, um, an update about the virtual in person learning. I have received some concerns from teachers uh, that have been brought to my attention. So I wanted to, uh, as we look at the adoption of the agenda, to look at give an update about the in-person and uh, virtual learning. Um, although we've been in school since October 19, I think that we still should receive an update. Uh, teachers from many different levels, elementary and secondary, um, have expressed concerns about being struck. Um, one teacher wrote a thing that the board has forgotten that the confident of high school is different than elementary. We are dealing with adults, scholars, they have kids, jobs, and the, and the choice not to participate in school phase on the distant learning plan. Another teacher wrote, has the system documented at what point they will return to virtual instruction due to COVID increasing in this area? I know that Leader Holmes has asked several points. Uh, via text about this, and there's been no definite answer. And so I wanted to know if somebody would speak to 
what that intent and is in the event that we have to return back to personal instruction due to COVID cases increasing. Okay, so I I hear the, hear your comments, and so we you would like an I understood you to say you would like an update at some point in time on that. Are you able to be done in this meeting? Um, we are not prepared at this time to be able to do that on the fly. Uh, those have taken a lot more time, and one of the reasons we're you're virtual and we're meeting at four o'clock today is to keep our meeting at a, at a decent time frame because of the election night. We can get that information updated to you, though. All right, as long as that information can be submitted to me, I will greatly appreciate that so that I don't have to keep following up about that question. I feel like we've been given enough time to get that answer. I know at least for a month, we are home since asking about that, and there's been no uh, response. There has been response to the board. I'm not sure your microphone's on, Mr. Smith. The response we gave was that if a school gets to the point where 50% of their classes have been put on quarantine, that school will be closed for 72 hours, cleaning, and then reopen. That's the answer we have in our plan. And I gave that answer some days ago in response to the text. Okay. So at this time, then, we have a motion and a second. Uh, oh, Mr. Hoffman, I think it's our due diligence to make sure that we communicate that because several teachers have reached out asking that. So I think that we should at least communicate with our teachers. Okay, that is duly noted. Um, with that, I enter. If you're in favor of the adoption of the agenda, raise your yellow card, please. Or your hand, Mr. Brown, or your. I'm in favor. Okay, it'll be five votes. All right, we're going to move on then to our recognitions. Ms. Barbara Doe Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, let me say welcome back. Good to be back. We have missed you. You look wonderful. Glad you're here. All right, there's several recognitions tonight. Uh, number one, the group in Salton County School System, first semester district level, most valuable parent, Miss Melinda Owens. Good afternoon. I'm Melinda Spillen tonight. <laughs> Happy National Family Engagement Month to parents and guardians. What you do each day to support your scholar is very much appreciated. In the words of Holly Brown, Carver Road's media specialist and parent liaison, when parent engagement wins, we all win. Let's give our parents and guardians a round of applause. <laughs> the most valuable parent program was started nine years ago as a way to recognize volunteers within the Griffith Spalding County school system. I'm honored to stand before you this afternoon to recognize the outstanding school level volunteers for the first semester. And the nominations were Beaverbrook Elementary, Rebecca Corley, <coughs> Crescent Elementary, Leilani Croft, Futal Road Elementary, Samantha Bonner, Jackson Road Elementary, Mia Beasley, Kennedy Road Middle, Tabitha Hunsucker, Griffin High School, Charmel Gaston, Spalding High, Jim Stanley. The Griffin Spalding County School System is proud to recognize Leilani Crump from Crescent Elementary School as the first semester district level MVP. Please give Ms. Crump a hand as she comes forward. <laughs> Will Ms. Chambers, the principal, and Ms. Rhonda Grubb, the parent liaison, please join Ms. Crump up front. Crescent Elementary Road. Lonnie Crump went above and beyond this month when she was asked to be our school's parent co-presenter for our Fall into Learning Virtual Parent Workshop. She not only shared fun academic websites and apps that other parents can use to promote online learning, but she also incorporated the help of her three children. With Ms. Crump's guidance, her children made a video in which they walked parents and students through some of their favorite websites and apps. Viewing the video of the Crump family was one of the highlights of the parent workshop. On behalf of the Griffin School and County School System, and our MVP sponsor for this evening, Kroger, thank you for giving us your time and talents to the students, staff, and families at Crescent Elementary. <laughs> and will Mr. Crump's husband also stand so we can thank him for his support as well? <laughs> thank you so much. 
Congratulations, we're very proud of you. Next, the Sun City Civic Temple Observance Heart Award recipients, Sue McDonald. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to represent Sun City Civic Team Club, which I am a member of. I do live in Sun City and represent District 5. Tonight, we want to honor two very special special ed teachers. Um, some uh, Civic Team Clubs all over this country and all over the world always honor teachers with regards to how they take care of their students and teach their students. Tonight's awards go to Dr. Vanessa Canty at Griffin High School. Principal is Dr. Buford Kellogg. And we have um, Glenn LaBeouf at Cowan Road Elementary School and Dr. Holly Harville is the principal. If these two fine ladies would come forward, I would sure would appreciate it. Thank you. Also, also tonight, Sun City Sitan, is, it, we did this, I think, for the, Mr. Smith for the first time last year, is that correct? This is correct. Okay, so this year, the second year award winners will also receive a $50 check for from the Sun City Civic Tank Club to each of these outstanding teachers. And the, the certificates read, presented to Vanessa Canty and, and Gwen LaBeouf for exemplary leadership, dedication, and outstanding service in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thank you so much and congratulations. Griffin Sullivan County School System Educator Hall of Fame inductees, Mr. Jim Smith and Mr. Adam Keith. Thank you, Ms. Cook. And I also want to thank Ms. McDonald and the Sun City Civitans for the award of Service Heart. You picked two outstanding examples of educators honored tonight with that. And I appreciate very much the work that you do, and I appreciate y'all for recognizing them in that very much. We have another special recognition tonight, one that um, I've looked forward to every year now for the, I think we've done it probably seven or eight years maybe. I think it started with Jones was here. And we've been able to keep this going. But this is, this is one of those very special, special recognitions when we honor educators with a Hall of Fame award. They have been nominated by students, uh, peers, community members, with letters of nomination, et cetera to back up the, the um, assertion that they deserve to be in the Educator Hall of Fame for Griffin Spalding County. And over the years, we have probably put in a total of about 25 or so in the Hall of Fame to this point. And tonight, we have three additional very, very deserving individuals add to that list. These are three that you'll see being very remarkable servant leaders. Tonight you'll see a video um, presentation on each one of them, a video presentation that was um, remarkably hard to narrow down because of the, um, the amount of information that had been gathered, the number of videos and, and, uh, and things that had come in. But we do hope that it has captured their significant legacy to Griffin Spalding County Education. And those inductees be Mr. C.W. Daniels Sr., Ms. Sarah King Madden, and Ms. Gail Manley Hammond. We appreciate all of them being represented here tonight. Our first inductee will be Mr. C.W. Daniels Sr. And if you would show the, um, the video a recognition of Mr. Daniels. C.W. Daniels. Uh, was very kind 
very supportive, very loving. Very supportive. So he was a man of honesty, a man of character, a man of great wisdom and knowledge. His character was above reproach. <laughs> very protective. Very protective. No one ever called him Cyrus. Yeah, he was CW to everybody. He was a great husband to Mrs. Daniel. Uh, uh, see, that man and his wife, they, they were great helpers. And he was very meticulous. Uh, he was very punctual. Uh, he was the kind of person that dotted every I and crossed every T. He was par excellent. So he was a great person. He was a father of two children, and we have that history. Brenda, the oldest, and then Cyrus. Daniels, Cyrus Wilburn Daniels, Jr. And during the time that we were raised, as you know, things were not integrated, they were segregated. So it was important to them for us to use the brain power we had in order to make ourselves better and be qualified for whatever it is that we wanted to do in life. In the community, when he was a member of the Citizens and Improvement League, he loved preparing the young men for the all boy state. He was a veteran himself, so he was part of the VFW. Daniels was involved in the National Education Association, the Georgia Teachers Education Association, the Griffin Retired Teachers Association, Older Americans Association, American Legion Post 546. He served on the boards of the Griffin Housing Authority and the Flint River Regional Library. That was is, is a person who, who looks at the whole. So in working with the students and with the faculty, he wanted to make sure that not only were their uh, ac academic minds fed, but their creative minds their artistic minds as well. So he encouraged various clubs to be formed within the school in order to uh, give children a chance to be more creative. Like we had a debating society, creative dance, uh, social organizations like what you would find on a college campus. And he walked the halls or Fairmont High School. He encouraged them to learn how to write speeches and deliver speeches grammatically correct that formed thoughts from the beginning to the end. Uh, with the church, oh, he was always at the church. He was a firm believer that you go to church and you worship God and you do what you can. You use the skills that God gave you in the church. And so he worked, you know, with the deacon board and he was a treasurer. He was a financial secretary and treasurer. And just made himself available to most of the members of the church who were in need. And my dad was very involved in Mount Zion Baptist Church. He was most passionate about students taking every opportunity that was given to them, not to look at education uh, any other way but as something positive. He wanted them to excel. He wanted them to succeed, and they knew it. And so when they did, they'd come back and tell him. He helped Larry Rayfield Wright. He played, as you know, pro football with Dallas. Well, my dad somehow arranged for him to get some financial aid for school. And in so doing, it helped him complete college. And, of course, he was drafted to the pros. And when Larry wrote a book called, I think it was called Just Right, he made mention of how my dad helped him and how he, he received this money every month but my dad never would tell him where it came from. No nonsense attitude. Having a Christian-like character. Always wanting to help people. He was a mediator.
especially during the times when the schools integrated, there was a reasonably smooth transition of closing Fairmont High School and the students there going to Griffin High. But what he did is, in working with, with Griffin High, they came up with a, a means by which once the students came to, to Griffin High, they did not feel like they were just there. His goal is that he, did, he wanted them to be comfortable going into a new situation. He served as director of secondary education for the school system. When, when we were in school during uh, segregation, but we didn't realize we didn't have. We didn't realize that the reason why we didn't have a bus to take us from Fairmont over to the stadium, that we marched it. We marched over there. We marched back. We didn't think anything of it. We had fun and enjoyed it and thought it was just something marvelous. So what he did, along with the teachers at, at uh, Fairmont, was not, he caused us not to realize that we were in, an, in a situation where we weren't supposed to be getting top-notch education. We weren't supposed to be getting new books. We weren't supposed to be getting new uniforms for the band or dresses for the choir. They just made us feel like we were, we were as they say, we were the bomb. We, we just thought Fairmont High School was it. They are so proud of where they came from. And, and I, I look at that as a testament to my dad. Probably had one of the longest tenure as principal of historical Fairmont High School. And he was a counselor. And he was a great... Uh, uh, master of detail. And he was a great man. That is left for us today. And what an example we have to follow. His uh, daughter, Denise Daniels, is here representing her dad tonight. And if you would come forward. Daughter-in-law, sorry. Daughter-in-law, if you would come forward to uh, receive a memento of this induction and a lapel pin that we have recognizing Mr. C. W. Daniels, Sr. as a member of the Griffin Spalding County Educator Hall of Fame. this award and I know that my father-in-law he loved the, the staff and he loved the, the children at the school he wanted to see them do well and everything that they were uh, had had for them to do and to be successful in life he was a true leader of the educators and he was an advocate for children um, he loved serving the community he loved serving the church and he loved his family. So I truly appreciate you all doing this and letting us have this honor and privilege of accepting this award on his behalf. Thank you. Conducting a mother-daughter combination. 
into the Educator Hall of Fame tonight. And I had the, had the unique um, experience when I was in the ninth grade of having um, Ms. Manley teach social studies in one period. And then I had Ms. Hammock for English and type. So half of my day was spent in their class. <laughs> and uh, have, have always thought that typing was one of the most practical things I ever took in school. But it still used it so much. We're going to start with Ms. Sarah King Manley, um, who was a social studies teacher for many years in our division. Would you please play the video recognition of Ms. Manley? She was a very giving person, and she believed so much in education. I cannot tell you the sacrifices she made to make sure all of us had a college degree. There was never a question that we weren't going to get an education. And even her mother was that way. And she had an aunt who took her in and paid her tuition so she could go to college. And uh, she, she believed strongly in education and uh, community involvement and uh, family. She was very smart, very intelligent. She was a real scholar in a bunch of different ways. Uh, she had a huge uh, span of knowledge and interests. Uh, she did crossword puzzles in an ink pen. My mom was uh, one of a kind. Um, she had energy um, like you couldn't believe. Um, she was dedicated to her family, number one, and then to, also to her God. She was um, somewhat strict, but she always listened to us. Uh, so uh, as a mother, um, I would say she was um, just the best. She was well-rounded, and she made my dad a good wife. He ran a peach packing shed, and that wasn't always easy, particularly the years the peaches got killed. But Mother rolled up her sleeve, went back to work, and taught, and made it, made, us, made it possible for the three of us to get a college education. You know, she taught not only school, uh, academic school. Uh, she taught uh, Sunday school class at the Baptist Church for 40 or 50 years. Uh, and. Uh, I remember when Bruce Morgan, Dr. Morgan, preached a funeral. Uh, she said, he said, if the Baptist Church had saints, she'd be one. So she was that kind of person. My mother believed in the motto, uh, volunteerism is the price you pay for the space that you occupy. I never knew where that quote came from. But she spent a lot of her years um, volunteering. Um, she was on a number of local uh, boards. Um, she was um, very involved in her community and her church in many, many ways. My mother was smart as a whip. She originally meant to be a doctor, but then it wasn't quite enough money at that point for her to go to medical school. And she uh, went into education. When she was teaching, she she taught uh, several different courses. I know math and history and maybe some others. She was curious about the world around her and she wanted to instill that curiosity basically in her students. She could have taught anything, I guess, and, but basically she most of her career was spent at Spalding Junior High. About mid-career, she did change from social studies to teaching math and they had a shortage of math teachers and my mother was a bright woman there was no question about it and she got uh, got right into the math curriculum and finished her career as a math teacher and as i recall uh, she was awarded star teacher uh, by one of her very bright uh, young math students so um, he nominated her and she she just loved that honor Started out, I believe, teaching algebra at Spalding Junior High. And then uh, at some point she got asked to do world history. And I think she did it the most. And she was head of the history department when she retired. She would pull in uh, biographical 
uh, information and really taught history through the historical figures who were the movers and shakers of the particular period she was covering. So I really think she was ahead of her time. Um, she was a formidable woman. So I don't think the principal gave her any trouble about teaching like that. And I would just kind of say that she was a little bit ahead of her time in that way. I feel like she was my first mentor as I saw her teaching and the manner she taught and the dedication. You know, I think, I think her biggest uh, reward, if you would say that, from teaching was to see the students that she taught develop. She was teaching when uh, we integrated schools. And that integration was uh, challenging for many people, not only the students who were coming into new schools, but for the teachers as well. Um, but I remember my mother embracing that process. Now, my father at that time, I believe, was chairman of the, of the Board of Education, so probably she didn't have any choice, but she did pri uh, pride herself in um, relating to her new students. And um, I think that was, to me, could be a stellar moment for her was during that uh, integration period. Uh, you know, she, she just uh, loved what she did. Uh, she was compassionate, but she was demanding. She, she required uh, people to, to uh, reach their potential if, if they could. Uh, she was very fair. Encouraging, always encouraging. And My mother would give it all that she had in whatever she did. And I think maybe that's why uh, she may be recognized. When Sarah Manley took on uh, a, a challenge or took on a new curriculum or uh, a new piece of educational uh, philosophy that was coming down, um, she would embrace it and give it all of her energy. Um, she was never what you would call a, a rebel rouser, uh, but she stood her ground and um, she, she gave a lot of energy. I think that would be uh, what I would say. Um, the, I remember there was a counter in our kitchen and she would grade her papers on that counter. And after she retired, I remember visiting once and seeing all the uh, ballpoint pen marks that had strayed onto the countertop from all of those years of sitting there late at night grading papers because she wanted to get them right back to the kids so that they would know how they were doing. She was what she was. I mean, you know, there was no pretense about Mother. She, she was very outspoken and she believed in things very, uh, much. She believed in women's rights before that was a, a big issue and uh, she, one of the reasons she was such a supporter of CBF was because they would allow women to preach and to be ordained to the ministry and, and, and to have leadership roles and so I think, um, I don't remember, she never marched with a placard or anything but she very much believed in women's rights, she believed in uh, educators' roles in society, uh, and she believed in being faithful to your God, frankly. She, uh, th that about sums her up. What a marvelous legacy that she's left as well. Her three children are here tonight to help uh, recognize her. Mr. Taylor Mann is here, Ms. Gail Hammett, Jane Wheelis is here tonight. Uh, Ms. Willis, if you would come forward, if you're going to represent uh, your mother and receive this memento that uh, recognizes her induction in the Griffin Spalding County Educator Hall of Fame. And we appreciate you driving from uh, North Carolina today to, um, to receive this.
Um, our mother didn't suffer fools lightly. She really uh, expected a lot out of all of us, but she gave uh, from her gifts. So thank you very much. Mrs. Gail Manley Hammett has also been nominated for production into the Griffin Spalding County Educator Hall of Fame. And it is uh, my pleasure now to ask for our video tribute to be played. Uh, I'm Chris Hammock. I am a high school science teacher. I picked up the baton of teaching from my mother when uh, uh, the year she put it down was the year I picked it up. So we have a straight line of teaching going from my grandmother to my mother to me and now uh, my brother's daughter is teaching uh, as well. And I came from this long line of teachers. Uh, grand, my grandmother and my grandfather on the Board of Education and my daughter now, who's uh, age 30 in Macon, is uh, teaching at uh, Miller Middle School, so the tradition continues. I'm Gail Hammock and I uh, have lived in Griffin all my life. Uh, I taught all total parts of 38 years and it, initially I had majored in business education. Uh, I taught typing, I taught shorthand, I taught bookkeeping. I had a minor in English and I loved it. And all of a sudden I realized it was a lot more fun to turn kids on to reading and, and learning, uh, you know, about great literature and, and being able to use their language well. I went back and I got my uh, got a major in English. And then eventually down the road, I got a master's in English. and. I spent the majority of my career teaching ninth grade English. Uh, English was my love. It, I felt it was calling. It definitely was uh, more rewarding and it was more, I guess you'd say, my cup of tea. Scott Slade was one of my students. So he's on WSB and has done beautifully with them. And he came to me one day and said, Miss Hammock, could we please do something creative instead of those boring old book reports? And I said, sure, Scott, what do you want to do? He said, I want to make a movie. And so he made a movie about the sinking of the Titanic. But that started me to realizing that teaching needed to be more than lecture. It needed to be more than just writing everything down. And I think if my kids would say something they enjoyed the most, it was doing those puppet shows, doing those movies, doing those slide shows. And, and, and making literature come to life. Uh, she always taught the fantasy and the King Arthur and the Lord of the Rings. She had many times where a lot of folks would create these productions uh, for her projects. Uh, she introduced a lot of people to, uh, you know, really good literature. I felt like they needed to see literature come alive on the stage and for years, uh, we went to various things. Sometimes it was a city auditorium, sometimes it was Fox, whatever. And a lot of it was Shakespeare plays, you know. And you really had to work hard to turn these ninth graders on to Shakespeare. Well, I do remember the story of the uh, former student who um, the person was uh, considering taking their own life. And as Chris referred to, the 
one most stark thing was when the young man that was constantly in the principal's office, uh, Betsy Harris and I decided we were going to try to do something to get him to quit being in trouble. And what we did was we said, you know what, if you will get, stay out of the principal's office for one whole quarter, we'll take you out to your favorite restaurant one day and treat you to lunch. And somehow that simple thing made a big difference. And he did stay out of the principal's office for a whole quarter. And uh, as Chris said, years later, he came back and asked to see me and Miss Harris. And he said, I just want you to know, I ha I've been through some really low times, but there was a moment when it dawned on me that you two believed in me and I needed to believe in myself. So that was just, that doesn't happen very often, but that was, that was an amazing experience. As teachers, they had given that person enough sense of value to, uh, you know, they, they saved their life. And a great set of parents that uh, instill that love of, of reading and learning and, and then also service to the community. Those, those were the big things. And clothes closets, soup kitchen, furniture ministry, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, they were just really a great example of, uh, of walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And mom and dad, if they weren't, uh, if they weren't helping uh, people, uh, th they weren't happy. So values are usually caught, not taught, and so hopefully my brother and I caught a, caught a little of it. And uh, you know, if the church doors were open, they were there. So uh, uh, mom and dad have always uh, lived their Christianity. And you know, gosh, I think mom was the first uh, uh, chairman, female chairman of the of the deacons at, at First Baptist. My big passion for about 10 years was coordinating mission trips from our church. The main place was in Appalachia in eastern Kentucky. And for 10 years, we took about 50 adults every year. And not only did it help the people in Kentucky, but in my opinion, it opened our church up to the importance of missions. And all of a sudden, they, they wanted to work at the food pantry. They wanted to support the soup kitchen. They wanted to have a furniture ministry. And I've seen First Baptist just turn around because those adults got a, a love for missions. So those would be my two main uh, things that I'm most passionate about. A life of service, living the unselfish life uh, where you're giving yourself away. Yeah, I've, I've learned flexibility and that I keep that still to remind me that be flexible or you might get bent out of shape. So did you catch the chain there? There's four generations of educators coming in that family and the support of education in our community. And um, you also see this through all three of our honorees tonight. Not only are they being recognized for what they did in education, the classroom, the school, but also their involvement in community life as a whole and making a tremendous uh, contribution to, to the whole of Griffin and Spalding County. I can't think of anything I'd rather do tonight in my last official board meeting as superintendent than to recognize outstanding educators in our Hall of Fame. There's so much more, my neighbor is Gail Hammond, member of Griffin Spalding County School System, Educator Hall of Fame. This has gone on too long <laughs> for us, uh, but I am so appreciative, and it's such a thrill to look around this room and see so many of my students, i.e. Jim, i.e. Tim, and on and on and on. When I walked in the door, one young lady said, you taught me typing in ninth grade, and I, that's really been a thrill <laughs> to, to see how beautifully so many of the students have turned out. And on behalf of my family, I, I just am so appreciative 
of the recognition. You, you can figure that we love education. It's in our blood. And uh, I'm just so proud that my granddaughter is now teaching, and Jane has a daughter who is an assistant principal in the right. And so hopefully we can continue to encourage young people to go into teaching. It bothers me no end to hear somebody tell a teacher or a potential teacher, oh, you don't want to go into education. It is the one place where you touch so many lives in so many ways. And even, there may be a lot of paperwork, and certainly we've had to deal with COVID, but to be a teacher is a calling. And it's one that I love so very much, and I'm thankful. Thank you. seen tonight with the work of Mr. Adam Pugh, our Executive Director of Communications and Partnerships. We typically have done these inductions at a football game on the field, but this year with COVID it's a little bit different. But these videos will be shown ne at next week's home football games of Griffin High School and Spalding High School. Once again, another hand for our inductees in the Educator Hall of Fame. say thank you because I know a lot of students don't get a chance to tell their former educators thank you for what they have brought. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for that word. Mr. Chair, I want to congratulate all of the honorees tonight. Uh, we could not do what we do without your help. I certainly want to congratulate the family of C.W. Daniels. He was one of my husband's favorite co-workers. Uh, Gail Hannah, a personal friend of mine and someone that I taught under when she was department chair at Salden Junior High. And her mother, Sarah King Manley, who I knew briefly. But what a great legacy your family has for this community. You have to be so proud. And I, like Gail, have been an education mind high professional forever. And it is truly a blessing and an honor to be a part of changing lives and helping students make their dreams come true. So congratulations to all of you. We're very proud of you. Well done. Thank you. That concludes our board. <coughs>
Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Brown. I also want to say congratulations to all of the Spartan County Hall of Fame educators. A uh, special shout out to the family and to the legacy of Mr. C.W. Daniels. Uh, his granddaughter is a great friend of mine, and Therese Daniels, Kelly and Therese Daniels. Um, and I just want to say that his legacy uh, and her father as an educator, if I can recall it correctly, uh, he was the first director of secondary education for Griffin Spartan County School System um, as an African American male. And so we say congratulations to all of our Hall of Fame educators and ducties. But a special shout out to the Daniel family for their contributions of the Griffin Spartan in education and in the arts. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you so much for being here, all of our guests. We're going to take just a quick break. It is uh, 5 4 is that right? According to that particular clock. So at 5.08, we are going to start back. So uh, if you would like to stay for the rest of the meeting, we invite you to stay. But if you would like to leave, we understand that offer. Thank you. 
graduated from Spalding High. One who is presently at Spalding High is a 10th grader. His name is Luke. And I'm here humbly to tell you, um, to give you a glimpse of what's going on in homes right now. To give you a glimpse of what kids and families are dealing with. Um, there is a ton of frustration, a ton of unknowns, as you all know, because of COVID. And I just never in my life have posted on Spalding County discussion page anything other than my dog was lost. Um, but I just felt the need, I wanted to hear what are other people saying about this. I feel like we need a forum for parents to speak about what their kids are dealing with and what we are dealing with as families in our homes right now. I would love to have a public forum outside so anyone and everyone can come. I don't know if you want to call it open mic night, whatever. You got 30 seconds, one minute to say whatever's going on. But parents are frustrated. They're angry. They don't know what to do. They don't know what's going on. We have no idea what the spray semester looks like. We've, um, anyway, I, I, wanna, I wanna just start first with when COVID hit. I had a senior in high school and a freshman in high school. In 24 hours, their life was completely changed turned upside down. Like for me, I still work, I still have a routine. For kids who had structure throughout the day, pretty much eight hours a day, plus usually in the evenings, they went from that to nothing. 
Nothing. No purpose, no friends, no social life, nothing. And I don't know if any of you have grandchildren, children that you've talked to about this, but that rocked their world. They're, they, I have kids, strong students who are very motivated. During that time, they hardly did any work. I would pretty much chalk that semester up as an academic disaster. And granted, I'm not pointing fingers at teachers, at the board, at anybody in particular. COVID-19 is unprecedented times. We're all figuring things out. But going forward, something's going to have to change. Because right now, at home, virtual learning, which we have done, not by choice, but we did it. Um, my son, who is a very strong student and very motivated, really struggled. I mean, we had many days I walked in the room. Luckily, I was home some. I had the flexibility to do that. He'd be asleep at the desk. The teacher's talking. has no idea he's asleep. There are kids sleeping through school. They are checking in that they're present. They're not present. When I hear these positive, loving teachers trying to engage their students, the kids are not responding. There is tons of downtime due to technology issues. That's why I'm here in person, because my internet goes in and out all the time in my house on East College. So my son, who has every one of his needs met, said to me, Mom, in January, when I turn 16, if school's still like this, I'm quitting school. I'm dropping out. He has three brothers in college, three brothers very successful, graduated from Spalding High. And the fact that my child is saying that, if my child is saying that, I cannot imagine what the children in this county who do not have their needs met, who are sitting in a house right now with no heat, who have do not eat three meals a day, who do not have parental supervision, they don't even have paper or printers, many of them. How are these kids actually performing? How are they actually doing in school? I want to know stats. I care about my county and I care about kids. I've worked in ministry with high school kids floating high for the last 10 years. I have spent endless hours with kids. They struggle terribly pre-COVID. Yes, do I need to stop? One minute. Okay. So my question is, what are we going to do about this? In-person learning right now is exactly like at home, except you're literally, not literally, chained to a desk with a mask on for eight hours. It is not attractive. It is not appealing. If you send me a survey, which you did last week, that says, are you going to do in-person learning next semester? I'm going to tell you no based on what I know right now. If nothing changes, my kid's going to stay home. And next year, because I have options, my kid, if it's like this, will not stay at Spalding High, and that's where he wants to be. Something has got to change. Other counties have models that they're doing that are working. Teachers are happy. Kids are happy. Parents are happy. Can we look and can we consider another model? Because what we're doing right now on these Chromebooks all day long is killing kids. They're not learning the quality of education in my opinion, it's gone down, and that is no fault of the teachers. They are working more than they ever have before. I appreciate your time. I wish you would check the pulse on our community. Talk to kids. They'll tell you the truth. Talk to teachers. You know, COVID may not be going away. We've got to find a long-term solution that works. Kids need to socially interact. That's how they learn. We cannot do this long-term. It's killing our kids. I have kids in college that will tell you also virtually their education is terrible compared to before. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming, Chair. All right, board members, we will uh, move on to our consent agenda. I would entertain a motion for that. So moved, yes. I have a motion by Mr. Holmes. Second. Second by. Uh, Ms. McDonald, all in favor signify by raising your yellow card. Or Mr. Brown, are you with us all still? Yes, in favor. Okay, that'd be fine. All right, um, we'll move on to uh, section seven, our action items. Um, first reading of our whistleblower policy, Mr. Smith. Yes, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, following that, a work session in October, uh, work was done with Mr. Shepard and uh, Mr. Aikens and Ms. Dobbs to look at the whistleblower policy and consolidate some of the comments that were made during that meeting. Uh, I asked Mr. Shepard if you would just kind of walk us through the draft and then uh, the comments can be made. Uh, since it is on the agenda, Mr. Chair, you could place this on first reading tonight and because it has to be 30 days, make any changes, we will bring it back to second reading in December. And, uh, and do a final adoption with whatever change you want to make. All right. Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief because we went through this at length uh, our last uh, meeting or the last uh, work session. Uh, the board had available to it just two or three components of the whistleblower policy. At that point, I was working with Mr. Aikens and Ms. Dobbins. We tried to pull this together uh, using basically the DeKalb policy kind of as a ticket. Uh, we borrowed slash plagiarized from them. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that I did address, uh, especially after uh, talking with the board, was the confidentiality provision. I think it's uh, H, I believe. G. E, okay, it's E. <clears throat> so I tried to, I mean, the board expressed a desire that uh, a reporter or whistleblower had the option to remain anonymous. So uh, I, I did my best to address what the board indicated that it wanted. Um, but I guess I should emphasize without going into details on this, this is first reading. If the board chooses to approve it for first reading, but that means that there's 30 days where there can be amendments or modifications made. Uh, Mr. Chair, you addressed one uh, with me before the uh, board meeting started. So I'll just lay it out there for the board and uh, listen to any comments that you have or any, any questions or any suggested changes. Okay, board member. Uh, one second, Mr. McDonald had already taken the floor and must have just been delayed. You can be next. Mr. Shepard, I just, just excuse me, I'm sorry. I just want to be sure I heard you correctly. So we will have 30 days to make amendments if we so choose, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The time period between first reading and final reading is a time for us to receive public comment and comments or Suggested changes from the board. Okay, because I'd obviously like to go home and read this for thoroughly and quietly. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Brown. All right, so first of all, I want to say thank you to the colleagues for entertaining the ability to even have a whistleblower policy uh, when you brought this up. And I think this is a picture where you can be uh, newly elected member for two years and, you know, being able to present a policy. So, I think of that, but I have some concerns. Um, when you think about a whistleblower policy, um, it's normally to member both in order to protect the employee from the threat of retaliation in the event that you know they report something or uh, something is in violation to their proper authority. And so I have some concerns about one piece of the whistleblower policy, and so I want us to, to truly um, think about this particular line in this policy. Under B5, unethical behavior or actions taken by a member of the River Quality County Board of Education, which violates the code of ethics for members as established by the Georgia legislature and are policies adopted by the River Quality County Board of Education. Now, if correct me if I'm wrong or give me more information, that this policy, how is that statement before the whistleblower policy? That's designed for certified and classified employees. Are you addressing that to me? I'm addressing it to, yeah, get more time. Okay. Well, I mean, you, you did specify, so I was waiting for somebody else to respond. So, so I mean, if somebody else wants to respond, I obviously give them more time to so people respond to it. I'm sorry? I couldn't understand. 
Go, go ahead and respond. Good answer. You can go ahead and answer. Okay. I put that in there because if uh, an employee, whether they be certified or classified in the system, uh, observes unethical or illegal conduct by a board member, they should have a vehicle in which they could report that conduct to have it investigated without fear of retaliation. Again, this is something that I tried to put together uh, based on what I understood the board wanted to have in a whistleblower policy. Uh, that line that Mr. Brown has questioned was in the presentation that I made to the board at the last work session in the, in the handout as far as protected disclosures. If the board, if the, or if the majority of the board wants to take that out, then that's uh, the board's prerogative. I mean, I repeat the policy, that's the whole point. Um, when I met with my team on yesterday, when we were going through the agenda, um, that's just one thing that, that stuck out to me. And as a board member, if I'm not mistaken, um, we are elected by the constituents of our district. How is it that there is, unless the board determines within the normal protocol of a procedure or a, a way that is going to handle if a board member is doing something unethical or outside of the norm and protocol. How is that left up to staff members to determine what a board member is doing? It's not left up to staff members. If it were uh, a report uh, of alleged unethical or illegal conduct by a board member, it would go straight up to the board. It would go where? Straight to the board. Straight to the board. All right, so I'm sorry. I was trying to make a company, but it seems like somebody else was talking. So if a board member it's a board member is unethical. It goes before the board as it should with our normal protocols. So I, I'm just confused. I think that should be totally taken out um, until it should be totally taken out because uh, that's what the norms and protocols that have been established by the board for the board is able to determine whether something has been done. I don't think that should be within the whistleblower policy. And that's just, that's my thought. I don't know what my colleagues know about that, but that is something that I uh, would like to either modify or again uh, be that it's on first reading. My, my thoughts on that are is as a board member, I think we have to lead and set the example. And so whatever we are asking of our staff, our central office, our administrators, our teachers, that we have to be willing to do the same thing. And so all I, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but all I'm reading is, is that this just gives the ability for someone who sees something that they feel is a violation, that they can report it under the whistleblower policy. And they will not be doing any investigation. It will be sent up the chain immediately so that the, some investigation can take place. And I would be all in favor of that just because I know we're not going to be doing anything wrong. That's true too, but it still brings the concern that um, I think for me it's the way that it works. Okay, so are you interested in maybe on working on some wordsmithing that you would like to do with it and still maintaining it so that it would be something that you'd be good with? Wordsmithing, uh, like, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in looking at some verbiage that I can bring to the board that our colleagues can agree on. Okay. Anything else within the document? Um, no, that was it. That was my concern. Okay. Um, Ms. Barbara Dip, any thoughts or comments? Okay, Mr. Zach? No, I'm, I'm fine. But I, I, I think what you know, I don't want to speak to Mr. Brown. I think he will, I guess, we want to make sure that uh, the 
board that's not being, I guess, governed or not governed, but uh, corrected or cheap by someone that files support. Am I right, Mr. Brown? I'm sorry, say that one more time, Mr. Holmes. Uh, that the board is not being corrected or governed by our support. And that is absolutely correct. I think that if we decide to do something like that, then each board member should have the ability, the authority, to appoint a board that's able to look at that. That's just like how the city of Richmond has and how the small, small county commissioners have. There's a, a board, a board, that hears those violations. And, you know, with, with you saying that, I, you know, I remember the discussion I think I had with Mr. Doss. Uh, we we, we uh, want to prevent uh, that going to that level of going out publicly or uh, having someone that, that we should kind of govern ourselves, the board should, should govern ourselves. And and I think, I think you know, we're, we're, we should be capable of doing that without having a citizen board as you referred to. Uh, and I think it's very important what Mr. Uh, Shepard already said is that if, it, if it, an employee sees something, reports something, it comes directly to the board, then it's then left up to the board to make those decisions. And based upon what it is, whether or not we feel as though it is something that we can handle within ourselves, or maybe it is borderline violation of the law, and we may need to do uh, other steps in that case. Well, what I'm just saying is if, 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 if that something like that happens, we should already have it laid out. We can't do it in business and just wait for it to happen and then want to deal with it. As a board, it is our job to set policies and procedures. And so if we're going to go that far, we need to go ahead and have it already set in place and have already things rolling in, in the event that that happens. Okay. So being piecemeal or as it happens and then you deal with it and then having it, I, that's that. He already has the outline, just like there's a grievance problem. Just like we're going to be admitting or changing that classified members are able to, uh, you know, submit a grievance and there's a process for it. So just like that, it should be the same thing for the board members who are actually there to set the policy to be sure that, you know, the school district is able to move forward with progressive ground. Mr. Chairman, it would be no problem at all to add a section to the policy that would deal exclusively with complaints that involve allegations of misconduct by a board member. I would suggest if we do that, we just then uh, refer to the uh, code of ethics for uh, board members that we've already, ado we've already adopted. It's already on the books, and that code of ethics provides for how uh, a, an allegation of unethical conduct would be would, would be handled. So we could just refer, refer, refer to that. So we could do an extra, uh, an extra a new, a new add of sections, what I'm trying to say, that would take care of Mr. Brown's uh, concerns. Okay. All right, the only, Mr. Brown, are you finished then? Yeah, in fact, I will be offering an amendment uh, to that. And okay. so I think we can deal with it in the next 30 days, but I will be offering an amendment to that that speaks to or I mean, I guess, against the verbiage that is going to be used um, for the right of this particular policy. Okay. The only section that I saw, that I, or actually I had two little things, um, section D, the reporting and appeal, uh, when a whistleblower goes to their administrator, uh, they get a reply back, they don't like the answer, there is an appeal that takes place, and that's done in a written form. I would suggest that not only does, is the administrator aware of the appeal and has to deal with that, but an email or something that's sent uh, up the chain to that next level, whether it's uh, Dr. Sauce or Dr. Warren, that they're just made aware that a, a teacher has made an appeal of a, a decision that the administrator has made just so that they can be in tune to that. 
That way the teacher is also feeling like, you know, am I going to have to take this even farther? And they may or may not know whether they should or should not. That just allows there to be some accountability in my, my thoughts. And that's a great idea to share my thing that if it's an amendment or modification, that there's someone that needs to be where the board is able to put in writing. Um, just like when we do have a policy or you're debating a bill or debating a policy and you're speaking for or against it, you have to make an amendment. And those amendments are brought to the floor and that's the other body. So I think that whether it's my amendment or your amendment, it needs to be put in writing so the board can see it um, in, its, in its totality and we're able to look at it and go from there. Absolutely. That will definitely take place. The second thing and the last thing that I had is I had just a, a question mark about Section H, the exception, uh, sexual harassment. Uh, my thought process on this was I'm a teacher. I view what I consider to be sexual harassment happening between an administrator and another teacher. Uh, can I, is that, would that then fall under the whistleblower policy? I realize you're talking about, um, I think, routine personal matters. Uh, to me, sexual harassment isn't a routine personal matter. Maybe it is, but that, that, if you have a situation that you're talking about, that would go under the Title IX uh, policy. In, okay. in, in the and is that a direct in the tier system that you created? Is, is what addressed in the tier system? To the situation or scenario that Chairman Dawson is getting, could that be addressed in the tier system that you created? No, the way it should be addressed, and we figure out how to put it in here, but if uh, we kept picking on uh, Ms. Jane Doe two weeks ago, she's the teacher at, uh, at Moore. We recognize Moore in the uh, if she took it to the principal, the principal should be able to recognize this is a Title IX issue, and then it should be referred under the system's Title IX policy. Okay. Any other questions, comments, board members about whistleblower policy? And then my question then is going to be, as they're beginning to work on some of these changes and these uh, um, additions, amendments for the next reading, uh, does anybody have any objection to be, it be put on the first reading? Okay, what's that then? I would entertain a motion for our, our whistleblower policy to be put on the first reading. I have a motion by Ms. Cook. Second by Mr. Holmes. Any discussion? Boy, I think I just look at that whole plate. Hold on, back to the plate. Can you remind that to be doing one second? All we're the the changes that you discussed, the changes that I discussed, we're going to work on putting those into written form within this document. But why is the motion made for that? It's a no, the, the the motion that was made is just to put the document at, on first reading because it'll be 30 days before we would have second reading, and that would start the clock for us to be able to make these small changes that we do have to make. Okay, okay, I'll meet you now. I'll pull off my set. No problem. Now I see you. So, um, all in favor signify by raising your yellow card or saying aye. Aye. All right, it'll be five votes. Mr. Garvey, you need to get in Jane Doe on the control <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Chair, we'll be placing this on first reading as it's presented tonight. And any amendments that you would like to see, you'll, you'll submit those in writing so that we can have those added to the agenda for December or I guess before we actually work it into the, into the document itself. But you'll, you'll submit them, correct? For the work session. For the, all right, so these, well, yeah, we need to see a funnel before the work session so that it, everybody is see if it works. right. Yeah. Hopefully, we w should. Hopefully, we have done it via email and different things, and everybody has submitted their stuff, and they're all good. And we won't take a lot of time at the work session on this. Okay. 
So if Mr. Brown, he said he wanted to draft the amendment, if he'll give it to me, Mr. Austin, give me a call and uh, get it to me the way. Okay, you good with that, Mr. Brown? Um, I didn't know that we had to give amendments to the board attorney. I thought the board would look over the amendment and the attorney would do what the board sees fit to do. Well, we're just giving it because he is the one that put this all together. We're just getting it the hint so that he can put it into a document for us to view wholly. I don't think that's how it works, Mr. Chair. What it has to be is we offer our amendments and then it is discussed on the board, whatever changes up at that point. That's only how it's done. Mr. Brown, I think Mr. 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 Shepard pretty much acting like a, a, a scribe to get all his <laughs> in, in order. Uh, I don't think he, he's approving of anything. He's just getting it in order for us to be able to read and approve it on you know on the second reading. Okay, so can you can you set a deadline for I need the what I need to have that amendment? That's what I was going to address, Mr. Chair. If we, if we as board members have any amendments to what Mr. Shepard has presented to us tonight. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. I'm still speaking. Okay. So, as I just addressed, if the to give us a date where we can have that, so we can submit it in writing, and then that wasn't addressed, and then it looks like it's like all the fifth to start talking. I think that should be addressed before we move forward. Just, she was confirming what you were saying. So can we address it? <laughs> yes. I we'll, we'll give you uh, we're, we're all looking at our calendar so that we can set that date. I was just going to suggest that if, as board members, if we have any amendments to give to Mr. Shepard, our scribe, <laughs> to enter into the document to be approved that we have seven days to do that from today. Okay, anybody have troubles with the tent? All right, let's do that. Okay. All right, let's we'll, move this. We'll need to have that in the in the packet and going out at the end of that week, so that'll give us ship time to do it. Okay. All right. So the approval of a resolution authorizing acceptance of the donated property, uh, Mr. Smith, and I know what is this is. Yes, this is this is really a, one of those things that. Uh, very appreciative of the Chapel family for thinking of the sewer system when they looked for something to do with the DHA property. They had contacted us a few months ago, but then COVID kind of got in the way of, of moving this forward. But they have wished to donate the property, formerly used DHA radio station, to the sewer system. Uh, we did not, in our discussion with them, need to uh, operate a radio station as such. So all the equipment that was there, the radio tower has been removed that the building, the land is there. We feel that the building can be used in the future for some career tech pathway courses. And the land itself is contiguous to the back side of Griffith High School, which would allow for an additional entrance exit and the access to the football fields, track, baseball, etc. Okay. Now I think what you just said, we, that's a great idea. So a resolution is attached accepting that donation. All right, everybody saw that. Any questions about that resolution? Okay, hearing none, I would entertain a motion then for the acceptance of that resolution. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Cook and I have a second by uh, Ms. McDonald. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by raising your yellow card or saying aye. aye. All right, that'll be five votes. And we're moving then on to our presentation and discussion items. Mr. Jones is with us to talk about our financial report for July and August. Good evening, Mr. Chair and board members. Uh, I've said this a couple of times. It seems like I'm getting used to the tail end of the meeting when everybody's ready to go. So I'm not going to go through all this in depth, just to give you a few highlights and then highlight what might be happening or what will happen at the next meeting. So John, this is put you down so you make us leave in a good mood. <laughs> What's that now? So you, you, you're pulling up the, the rear of the meeting so you can have us leave. That's right. Leave. That's right. So let's talk briefly. Uh, July and August, these are catch-up periods. You know, uh, we've got our audit coming in two weeks. Uh, share a bit of detail on that with you in just a second. A uh, little activity going in in July. 
mainly our 11 to 12 month employees uh, uh, are getting paid during those times. So if you look at your financial data, so those salaries of the teachers, et cetera, accrued into the prior year, so you won't see a lot of spending. Uh, taxes typically are down in the summer unless it's motor vehicle related, uh, mobile home, things of that nature. Uh, the tax office is, you know, was processing, getting the bill sent out, so a lot of that's not heavy during the summer. State so revenues were up 17% for July versus July of 2019, so that's a good sign uh, based on the COVID playing out the way it has. Uh, and in the note, I'm on the, I'm on the recap here, you had some, a little bit of legal activity which we're reporting to you every month uh, for some September activity uh, in October. So uh, Smith provides a detail for you for that, but that was the dollar amount, 3600 bucks. Uh, a little bit of capital project activity, not a lot. We normally report this on a cash basis. So there's more invoices, but we just didn't pay a lot in July. And East Loss, the first uh, deposit for the uh, East Loss seat was approximately $925,000. So that was a, a good first step for that. And again, appreciative for the, for the voters who approved that before I got here, but uh, that, I understood that was a successful, good turnout election, and we're really appreciative of that. Um, so again, as you flip through reports, uh, I wasn't going to go through all that if some of the special revenue grant funds. We don't draw down a lot of money during the summer until the grants are actually approved. So that some of your receivables and stuff will be varying as I get on a little bit later in the year. Um, so for July, any, any questions on that, on that report? Board member? No. no? Okay. All right. we'll, we'll run through August right quick. Same kind of information, a little bit more paper going on in, in August. Uh, some of the 11, 12 month people come on board versus their accruals. Uh, same deal with the tax taxation, uh, uh, the TAF tax, the vision, things of that nature picks up pretty good during the summer, but the property tax is still lower during that time. State revenues were up 7.6% versus 17 that I just reported to you, so it was still a, ahead of the prior year. Uh, no legal activity that was paid to date, so as of this presentation, what I just told you is caught up to date uh, for your information purposes. Uh, I showed you on the summary, there's a, a, a few capital project expenditures. There was approximately a million bucks spent on technology. Uh, you all approved, uh, you know, additional hotspots, Chromebook type activity items. So that was what would be for that. And I listed the top four items of, of uh, per project listed on that summary page for you. And interesting enough, on our East Floss, they did an audit for East Floss 5 and paid it in East Floss 6. It was a million. $326,000. So your second East Loss deposit right after the 925 one was a million three hundred. So that, that, that's awesome in terms of uh, flexibility moving forward, uh, you know, whatever the superintendent board recommends to send that money on. So uh, as far as, and that's, that's the August report. When I come back with the September one, it, if it's if it's caught up in time to add to the one in two weeks, I'll have it completely caught up and that'll uh, include the last debt service payment. You know, we're out of debt, but just for the reporting purposes, I'll show you that. Um, and the last comment I wanted to make on, make on that, the superintendent said this was his last meeting, but we're gonna give him something good on the 17th. I've already been reviewing the draft audit report. So it, it'll be a good one as far as I've been able to tell. We, we wanna send him out with a good report and, and let, the, let the board be able to see that, that activity that I came on the board to support from last year. Any questions? I mean, that's Mr. super quick. Mr. Jones, so. any, any, any spending that wasn't covered from the COVID, that would be on the next report, correct? Right. Hold on, Mr. Brown. There's a question being asked. You know, as far as like the thermal cameras and there was a thermal camera invoice uh, that Mr. Aikens and Mr. Ballard submitted. I think it was, it, it was paid actually in October. We just wrote the check the other day, so it probably won't be till we can be October before we get to that. Okay. Floss six, actually. I got to redo one of the forms in here for the spending to, to add, add the fourth floss form. I've got the receipts page in here, but we haven't been any spending as of this report on, on the new floss yet. When, when, when we get that, just 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 for uh, information purposes, if we can, if you can include something to show. This, uh, what we spent, you know, to get the school prepared uh, for uh, uh, equipment and supplies and things of that nature, and what was actually covered from the money that we, we received, or did come out of our what came out of our, our budget? Uh, I, I, I personally would like to know, you know that. Re 
have a COVID expenditure. Right, 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 right. And I'll have to go back and, and look at the funding source to see if uh, if some of that is something we might can submit supplements later yeah. for reimbursement. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll we'll maybe talk about that. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Any other questions or comments, board member? Mr. Brown, did you have something? Hearing none. Um, there's information. But there was a new second that went home back for. But there was a new general on squash. Mr. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Regards to getting schools ready. Mr. Brown. I would love to see all those line items, all those items on the spreadsheet, uh, and the total that was spent as we were there. You know, we had to prepare um, for our October 19th opening. We missed the first part of what you said, but uh, my understanding is that you would like the line items of the things that were spent due to COVID and, and the process of reopening the schools? Yes, sir. The same thing that, that I think your home is asking for as well. Okay. Um, I was you are still going in and out, so um, we, will, we will be working on that. All right, we have informational items within your packet, the monthly facilities maintenance report and our construction. Uh, renovation progress. Make sure that you read those and if you have any Mr. questions. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, I have some questions with regards to our information items for monthly facilities and maintenance report. Okay. Um, in the pandemic, we know that it's essential that we are fully staffed with custodians so that the cleaning protocols may be carried out to fidelity. We also understand that it's a tough time economically for many of our residents in Spalding County. And with that being said, it seems like we have 16 uh, temp positions that are currently being filled uh, for custodians. What is our plan to uh, help to get our county and residents in our county uh, full-time employment as it relates to hiring staff for our custodians? Okay, Mr. Ballard is not in the room. Is that a question, Mr. Akins, if you can address? I think we talked about this. Well, we talked about this several times, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Akins may have some comments he'd like to make on it, but uh, we are still taking applications and trying to hire the positions that are open. Uh, we don't get a lot of either applications, or we end up losing people as well. Therefore, we've had to use the, the temporary agent, the temp agencies to help fill in gaps in both the maintenance area and the nutrition area. We've also, of course, as you know, had many of our several of our bus drivers who have taken on work in the maintenance in the, in the maintenance custodial area as well between the morning and afternoon runs to fill in the schools. And I can tell you right now their their contribution has been great and appreciated. So we are working very hard to get those done. But it's not as simple as saying we can go out tomorrow and have the application filled. I heard the question, Mr. Brown, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I heard the question more to not, we understand that part of it, but he was asking the ones that are in a temp position, how long is it going to take until we're, they would then be considered a full-time employee of the school system? Is that correct, Mr. Brown? Mr. Chair, I, it'd be my work. Mr. Chair, that there's uh, a minimum we use as a um, training and actually a um, probationary. Probation, period. thank you. I, yeah. I apologize. It's been a long day. Uh, we use a uh, probationary period, but we also work with our principals where they have them, uh, making sure these are employees that fit in those areas. Uh, and once we get those, we generally use 90 days, but once we get those, we're continuously working with those principals, uh, with those, and when they uh, are to the point that they feel those employees are a fit for their schools and uh, would be good employees for our system and fit our values, um, they let us know, and then we present them uh, for employment. Okay, so 90 days is kind of the general Policy. Yes, okay. Any other questions, Mr. Brown, with that? Uh, no, sir, not with that. Um, I do, I would like to know, at one summer, 
uh, it was very consistent in the departments that were before us asking to uh, minority owned businesses, whether they are African American, male, female, uh, women, veterans. So I would like to continue to start seeing that information in one of those reports um, as it relates to information items. Uh, Mr. Ballard has done a great job of being able to report that to the board. I know that as we continue to look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, as you saw today, we added the question to spotlight so that our schools can tell what they're doing and as we uh, look at the, the shift in being conscious and aware of their biases and how we're going to continue to serve our stakeholders, our scholars, our employees in every way that we can. And so I think it's really good as we continue to work together more, as we include in the FDA in the discussion, that we continue to get that information um, of the minority-owned businesses and contracts. Um, not going to spend much time on that. I think that we uh, do not need to drop the ball on that, but we can be consistent um, as we were during the summer when that information was requested. Okay. Thank you for that. So what are we asking about? There were, there were two purchases tonight of buses to elevate K-12, both of which we have used before, reported on before. Is that the information we're talking about? That is one of the things that was for the buses, but I'm looking at and all the reports that were given by the department heads for different departments. Um, I have not seen the diversity the different minority organizations. It could be, but it's nothing to report. So I just think there's nothing to report that that should be one of the items that's put into the report that there's nothing to report under that particular line item. And I thought the board agreed that that's something that we wanted to know um, as we continue to look at diversity and equity inclusion in our school district. Okay, and, and again, I'm just making sure you're referring to the uh, things that are in the consent agenda. Uh, yes, sir. we're talking about information items, right? Monthly facilities and rates report. So, previously, in that report, Bruce would have information that I'm talking about. I've not seen that problem in the last maybe two months. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for that. If we are now moving into our board member comments. So, look, Mr. Chair. Will that be addressed is what I'm asking. So I, I ask the question, will we continue to be consistent and report that information? I don't know if that's a question from Mr. Aiken or maybe the superintendent can direct for that to continue to be done. Well, we probably do that on the purchases that we, we've done. And we had one last month that was a new, a new vendor that point out uh, where the best status was. I'll talk to Mr. Ballard about things he may have been putting in reports in the past that are not showing up here, but typically, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that purchase information came in this, but I certainly would ask you to go back and look and see if there's something that has changed in the reporting. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Smith made reference that this was his last official business board meeting for, uh, for November. Uh, we still do have a uh, workshop slash mini uh, retreat taking place. Uh, but I want to add for our board member comments, there's lots of thanks for all of the things that our teachers and uh, administrators are doing. But I just wanted to take a quick minute and thank Mr. Smith for the hard work that he has done, especially through this very difficult season of 2020. I think we can call the whole year a season of, uh, uh, of some mishaps and things that uh, with COVID and, and different things that we've just had to deal with what's come away. And so uh, I wanted to let you know that I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, the board is meeting tomorrow in executive session at 4 o'clock. Uh, Mr. King will, from uh, DSBA will be presenting uh, 39 applicants that have made application for the superintendent position. So we uh, will break it down from there and see how it goes and uh, make sure our timelines are in place. We are doing our very best to uh, have that all done in the manner in which it's supposed to be done and not have to have an interim. But if uh, um, we're not able to, then we'll do what we have to do to make everything continue to work. So thank you for your hard work and, and the dedication that you've had. I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Barbara Joe, and then we will work our way down, and then Mr. Brown, we will end with you.
so I can see a friend that said the bar high. You still bring up five big onions. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to find something. You can bring up peaches and cucumbers and stuff. But I, I, I reserve my comments to the Okay. Is that I just wanted to publicly say this for the people who are here, not only here, but there are people maybe watching and listening. Uh, Mr. Smith, it, it, I just wanted to say thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you. It's been a pleasure working for you toward our common goal of teachers, parents, kids. And um, I wish for you and your family nothing but the best as, as you move forward. I'll miss seeing you around the yard barnyard so to speak but that doesn't mean that we can't see each other in ways that you know for lunch or whatever in the, in the days and months ahead but i just sincerely wanted to say thank you it's been an honor to serve with you on this board for the last two years thank you so much and janet i see you and and nothing but the best for you either thank you for sharing mr smith mr brown No comment. All right. Mr. Jones, can I just sure. just to sure. say, I, I, I could have done that. that uh, I uh, I was hired by the board in December of '96, and uh, Mr. Smith came on in the summer of '97. I can't tell you exactly which month. I'm sure he can. But I've had the the distinct pleasure of working with Jim Smith since the summer of 1997. And during that time, he has he is a consummate gentleman. And uh, Ms. Cook used the word integrity, and, and I echo that. Uh, he is absolutely a man of impeccable integrity and also dedication. I have, I have enjoyed working with him. Uh, I think I have become a better attorney by uh, the conversations I've had with him where he is not afraid to challenge me on opinions that I've offered and uh, I have enjoyed having those conversations. I have kind of miss calling him, getting him up from, from dinner in the evenings because something popped in my head and I felt like I needed to call him on himself before I forgot it. But Jim, I've enjoyed working with you and I hope you enjoy your time. Yes, I appreciate the kind words and I appreciate so much the opportunity to serve these last five and a half years as superintendent. It's not something I really ever thought that I would do. Certainly it's just one of those things that just kind of comes along in life. And um, I'm very proud of the things that the system has done. I think we've made a lot of a lot of improvements and a lot of accomplishments here. And I want to thank the staff. The one you see sitting around the edge of the scene cabinet. Um, They've done a great job from Dr. Saul, Dr. Warren, from Mr. Pugh, Ms. Dobbins, Mr. Aiden, Ms. Jones, Mr. Jones, Dr. Kennedy, and of course the um, impeccable Ms. Mullins. They really run this place. They have provided tremendous support and the principals of Ms. Ms. Pruitt and, and Ms. Ms. Um, Garvin are here, but the others in our system as well who have who've done a great job and, and, and taken the work and really taken it to heart. So, I appreciate the community support. We've got a great community. A lot of good things going on here. We can't always, we can't let ourselves focus on the negative. We have to focus on the things that are working and are going so well here because those are the things that are really impacting and better in our students. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I look forward to finishing out for this month in, in this holiday. So thank you. There we go. All right. Well, at this time then, we do not have anything for executive session this evening. We will be meeting tomorrow at 4. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. McDonald and a second by Mr. Holmes. All in favor signify by raising the yellow card or saying aye. All right. I don't see here Mr. Brown, so we will consider him.